Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is Tim O'Brien. He's going to share some stories about his friendship with Steve Goodman. We'd played together. Uh, he would have Hot Rise to help him do an encore. I found out later that he did that to anybody who was around. You know, they, you, would, you would play City of New Orleans with him. First you'd do Mama Don't Allow, and then you'd do City of New Orleans with him. But uh, so I was buddies with Steve. I, he was uh, a good, and he was, he endorsed me early on. I played a gig in Chicago. I got a week long gig there and he came to the matinee. Those gigs were the Earl of Old Town. You played three sets a night. And then on Saturday, you played like five sets. It ended at four in the morning or five in the morning. And, uh, you alternated sets with another artist. So there were like 10 sets of music going on on Saturday nights, going to about 5.30 in the morning. And then you'd do a matinee the next afternoon. So here comes Steve on the matinee, and I'm completely cooked. But he, a, a, a mutual friend had brought him, and we went out to eat, and then we went to Steve's place and played music for a couple hours, and it was fantastic. Steve carried my guitar. He said, this is the worst part of the business. He carried my guitar for me. I saw him play at Boulder at Tulagi. Uh, it was a uh, famous club on the hill near the university there. And uh, he had come into the music store where I was teaching lessons and talked to the clerk there. It was a buddy of mine. So he went down to see the show. And that was around the time of his first or second record. And I'd seen him, I think I'd seen him at a bluegrass festival. Yeah, I'd seen uh, 73 or so, I think it was. I went to one of these giant peace, love, and bluegrass festivals, which was really dogs and drugs and bluegrass. <laughs> <laughs> festivals put on by Jim Clark. And uh, he was on this side stage that was that had Newgrass Revival and John Hartford and uh, Steve Goodman and the Country Gentleman. And he started, the Country Gentleman had played their set, or maybe they were about to, and he said, uh, Doyle, you guys want to come up and play this with me? And they got the, the Country Gents all got up and sang City of New Orleans with Steve because they had recorded it. And that's the way Steve was. He wanted to jam with everybody, you know. At the finale of the festival, there'd be 100 people on stage, and he'd be back there strumming the hell out of his guitar, you know, just uh, just into it. So Steve started coming out to Telluride, and I'd been playing there with Hot Rise and before that with Ophelia Swing Band. So having met him in Chicago um, and sort of, you know, felt like we were on a you know, first-name basis, a year or so later, he was back in the hospital with leukemia. So all the time I'd met him up to that point, I didn't really realize that he'd had this health crisis that he'd been through and and sort of had made a vow that he'd just be the best possible version of Steve he could while, he's, while he was still alive. And that kind of explains a lot about him, just generous about everything and joyful about his performances and everything. So I heard that he was in a hospital. So Hot Rise was making our first record. And uh, we had the mixes, and so I put them on a cassette, and I sent them to the hospital. Somehow got the address. So the next next June, you know, that was probably like February or something. The next June, he comes up to the Hot Rise bus and knocks on the door and says, man, I want to thank you for sending that that tape. It really helped. I just thought, that's crazy. <laughs> But I think he really meant it. So he asked us to sit in, and we did the city of New Orleans and the Mama Don't Allow and everything. And uh, and then he had this tiny little little glass bottle with a substance in it. There was just a tiny trace of it in there for us. <laughs> and uh, that was Steve. And, uh, you know, every time we'd see him after that, we would do that. Um, he would come when we played at uh, L.A. at the... Uh, Santa Monica, actually, at the uh, McCabe's guitar shop. He would come down and want to try a new song out. He said, Can, do you mind if I play a song before your second set? And he'd get up, and he did this in Chicago, too, at Earl of, not at Earl of Old Town, but somebody, somebody else's troubles. He'd come, and he'd want to try a new song out, you know, perform it, perform it for folks for the first time or second time or whatever. And then we would, uh, we would uh, hang out or whatever and play later, but... That had to be a special thing for the audience, wasn't it? Really cool for the audience. And, you know, they all they generally knew exactly who he was. And it was always a good song. And, uh, you know, he was stellar. I, I always felt like, why, are you, you don't need to practice this. You got it cold. 
he played the hell out of the guitar. He he overplayed it, maybe. You know, he played more strings than he was meant to hit, but it didn't matter. It was always sounded good. And one of the times at Chicago, um, he was partners, ownership, part owner of a club called Somebody Else's Troubles, which was the title of one of his songs, that uh, name of the club. And his partners were Fred and Ed Holstein, who are folk singers from Chicago, and uh, Bonnie Kolak, I think, who was another folk singer up there. So he comes to the club and Hot Rise is playing, and he's he's with Jethro Burns. And uh, Jethro Burns is like a ultra hero of anybody that's ever thought about playing mandolin. You know, you hear him play, and he's... That's like miles above just where anybody would be able to go. And uh, so he brings Jethro down. And uh, so I'm thrilled. And uh, so I showed my mandolin to Jethro. And he said, uh, oh, he said, oh, this is a nice mandolin. He says, my mandolin's got a real big fat neck on it. It's kind of wider fingerboard than normal. I had it made that way. And Jethro says, wow, this is a lot different than what I play. He says, mine's more like a pencil. He says, but... uh." It only takes about five. He's playing away on this thing. It only takes a couple minutes to get used to it, though. <laughs> and he just, so he sat in with him, sat in with us. And uh, that was the beginning of another great friendship. You know, Jethro loved to play with uh, Red Knuckles and the Trailblazers. And he had, uh, Red Knuckles had, uh, you know, everybody in the Hot Rise band had their alter ego character. Waldo Otto was our steel player. So, so Jethro became the elder Otto. He was the elder Otto. And we had some, you know, uh, Western, you know, bolero jackets that we had for people to wear sitting in that matched a couple other jackets we wore. So he would, you know, find a cowboy hat and put on sunglasses. And we asked him on a show one time down in Texas if uh, what it was like when Waldo was born. Because Waldo plays as a buffoon. He's kind of like part Ralph Cramden and part Cousin Jody. If you ever seen Cousin Jody, you know, Played without his teeth. <laughs> Played the steel in a comic way. Physical comedy. So we asked Jethro what it was like when, you know, Waldo Otto was born. He said, well, you know, uh, it was really difficult to get a diaper that would do the job. <laughs> <laughs> he said, the way I describe it is more like a parachute. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Steve, I'm not, I'm not into the baseball so much, so I, he didn't talk to me much about that, although he was crazy for it, I'm sure. And I knew that he'd written that song about the Dime Cubs fan, Last Request, and they, they actually did fulfill his request. Albanetta did spread his ashes at home plate or whatever. Well, what I, all I know is that he'd written, Steve had written a song called A Dying Cubs Fan's Last Request, and uh, that he... Uh, wanted his ashes spread at Wrigley Field, and uh, and apparently the ashes sat on Albanetta's his manager's desk for years until he finally was able to get the request filled. So I, I wished I'd have been there for that. I know some friends of mine went for the event, and uh, one was Harry Waller, who is the guy to introduce Steve to me. I heard about Steve's passing. Um, he had gone to uh, Seattle for some kind of special, you know, last ditch kind of treatment. I don't know how I heard. Um, that was, I think, before the internet, and it was uh, word of mouth. It might have been through a friend. I'm not sure how I found out about Steve, but that was really hurtful. A really, you know, a real uh, blow. Uh, Brian Bowers was kind of helping him I think they were buddies and um, Steve was kind of hanging at his house before he went to the hospital and I think his some of his relatives were living at his house and uh, trying to help him through that 